Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the ANWA Deterrence Center. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, co-founder and vice president for research at the National Institute for Deterrence Studies. The ANWA Deterrence Center is a 501c3 organization ensuring a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent and its ongoing modernization. Thank you for listening and welcome to the show. The views of the host and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another great episode of NuclearCast. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Lowler, and today we have a great guest. You probably read his book, From Berkeley to Berlin, How the Rad Lab Helped Divert Nuclear War. It's a great book. Of course, I'm talking about Tom Ramos, and Tom is a, uh, you know, he spent a career at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Now he's a senior fellow at the National Institutes for Deterrent Studies as well. And he is, you know, he's a physicist who knew all the players in the Oppenheimer movie. And, you know, he he may look like a young guy, but he's been (laughs) around a while. And so he's seen a lot of this firsthand. And so we're going to actually talk. And because he wrote a book about it, how, how this happened, who did what, you know, he knows the players and he's he knows the details of exactly what happened and who did it. So we're going to spend at least a half hour. We may go into episode two of this to discuss with Tom, you know, and part of the reason I'm so excited is because I saw the Oppenheimer movie last night and I've, of course, read the book as well. So, Tom, with that long introduction, welcome to NucleCast. Hi, Adam. Thank you very much. That is a very kind introduction, too. I hope I don't disappoint you with my answers. No, I mean, if you write a book about something, then you got to have something to talk about. Because <laughs> if you can write three or four hundred pages, then you can certainly talk for an hour. So, and I know you, and so therefore I know we've got some great stories ahead. So let's delve into both the book and the movie, and let's start off. You know, let's sort of start off strong. Can you dispel for us, let's say, three of the the myths of the movie, the thing, the sort of the biggest things that they get factually wrong in the movie? Oh wow! Well, for me, the first thing that hit me is the producer uh, in one of his uh, uh, trailers introducing the movie calls Oppenheimer the the mastermind of the atomic bomb of the atomic age. And that's not, simply not true. Uh, if, you, if you're going to give that title to someone, it actually would go to a, a woman, a, a Jewish Jewish woman from Vienna, Austria. Her name is Lisa Meitner. She weighs about 90 pounds soaking wet. And she came up with the theory of nuclear fission over, over four days working with her nephew. And that's what really introduced the things. By the time, uh, by the way, uh, Dick Rose, uh, General Groves, who, who was appointed to lead the effort by the Army, the atomic program existed before then, but then the Army took it over and they named it the Manhattan Project. Groves' first instinct was to go see Lawrence in Berkeley to get him to create a laboratory that would help design that. Now, Lawrence had already started up the Y-12 plant in uh, in Oak Ridge to, to enrich the uranium to make a weapon. And he tells Groves, uh, look, I'm, I'm way... I'm way weighted down. I'm up to my ears with problems with Y12. Let me introduce you to my theoretical physicist in my laboratory, Bob Oppenheimer. And so uh, Lawrence introduces Oppenheimer to Groves, and Groves then offers uh, the opportunity to Oppenheimer to create the lab. And Oppenheimer agrees, and that's that's when everything moves down to Los Alamos. Um, so no, he's not the mastermind behind it. By the time he takes over the job, practically the bomb has already been designed. There's another thing that might be misconstrued. Let's see. I, I thought it was a bit of a disservice in the movie. They have the scientists at Los Alamos laughing right at, and they, in the, they superimpose the destruction of Hiroshima. Uh, and, and in the background, you see the people in Los Alamos laughing because they, their bomb was a success. I saw nothing at all that suggested that. The only thing I ever saw in, in the archives was the, the announcement of the end of World War II when the Japanese surrendered. Then there was a celebration at Los Alamos that the war was over, as people were celebrating all over the world. 
If anything, the proof that their work worked was at the Trinity event. It was not in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So I thought that was kind of a disservice to the citizens, uh, or to the, the scientists and engineers at Los Alamos. Let's see. Oh, one big mismo. They have one character in the movie. He kind of looks like a Gestapo German god from a Hogan's Heroes episode. He has he has wire rim glasses that are circular, and he has a circular face. He kind of looks like that Nazi guy in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, and his name is Ken Nichols. And Nichols, in fact, was a very handsome man at multiple degrees, multiple PhDs in hydraulic engineering. And he is the individual who provided the engineering expertise to get the Manhattan Project rolling. He practically built the Y-12 plant for Lawrence. He did other things. And he was friends with all these people. He was not he was not some uh, uh, Gestapo guy trying to, trying to ruin Oppenheimer's life. Ironically, it was Oppenheimer himself who insisted on having that hearing that you see at the end of the movie. Movie, and when he's told that President Eisenhower had revoked his clearance, then one of the first things he did that night was to call up Ken Nichols, the same individual who's portrayed as a villain, because see they were friends, and he called him up as a friend and asked for his advice and what should I do and stuff. So, so I think they kind of, unfortunately, gave Nichols' reputation a bum rap. He was really a good guy. He was a friend with Oppenheimer, tried to help him out, but he was not going to switch the rules if Oppenheimer was, uh, you know, kind of loose with the uh, with secrets, atomic secrets going to the Communist Party, which he admitted he was. Uh, uh, Nichols said, well, you can't have exceptions. Everybody has the same rules. That's about the only thing he might have come out with. I don't know if that's enough for you, but but that's what I saw in the movie. The movie became kind of a large apology explaining a way for, for Oppenheimer. The, in terms of facts, as I read, I read the book Prometheus, but also from his biographies, I believe Oppenheimer did not pull back the poison from that his his advisor, who was a Nobel laureate. He let the guy take it, and and the professor actually was dying. He was suffering terribly, and Scotland Yard had a warrant for Oppenheimer's arrest, and his mother had to come and get him out of England before he got arrested by the uh, by Scotland Yard. So that's also another thing that wasn't exactly portrayed correctly in the movie. Yeah. And, and it was pretty clear that Lewis Straws was portrayed as, you know, this villainous guy and, yeah. and somebody who was sort of a master political puppeteer w was, how yeah. accurate was that? Uh, well, no, he was not, he was not an ultimate villain. He was, he was a, pro he was Jewish from New York City, as Oppenheimer had been, and that's where they first met in New York City, uh, where Strauss tried to get um, Oppenheimer to get more active in Jewish activities. But Strauss came from fairly humble beginnings. He, he was a traveling salesman, I think. I remember in his biography, going uh, on train tracks, trying sell, selling things. He worked his way up, but he got it kind of self-educated, became uh, became pretty uh, proficient and be was a very organized, very talented young man and rose up in ranks. And then um, uh, they asked him to take over the Atomic Energy Commission uh, because the, the directors at the time were, were really slow in recognizing the threat of thermonuclear bomb coming out of Russia and they were not wanting to react to it. And the president and Congress are both getting nervous and, and then Strauss was purposely chosen to become the chairman of the commissioners in the Atomic Energy Commission for that reason. And he did get things moving. Um, now, what is true is that Oppenheimer did humiliate him once at a congressional hearing, which Strauss did not forget. And it, it did sour Strauss quite a bit, as I think any one of us would have been being ridiculed in front of Congress like that. But, uh, but frankly, when after the war was over, uh, Strauss also uh, was the head of the committee to choose the president for the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton. That's where that's where Einstein lived with Eugen Wigner, Johnny von Neumann, all these great mathematicians and physicists of the day were living there. And Strauss had to pick a chairman. He was he was a chairman of the committee selection committee, and his first choice was to pick Oppenheimer. So he went out to Berkeley. Oppenheimer at the time after the war went back and started working for uh, Lawrence again. And he went to uh, he went to Oppenheimer and asked him to take over the Princeton Institute, which is a very very prominent position. 
Of all things, Oppenheimer said, I'll think about it, which kind of teed off uh, Strauss a little bit. But about six months later, Oppenheimer came and says, yes, I'll accept the position and then left Berkeley and went to Princeton to become the head of the Institute. And that's where really that's where I, Oppenheimer really began to have an association with people like Einstein, Johnny von Neumann, who was not in the movie, but uh, he was an extremely prominent, probably the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. He gets to know him, and he gets to know uh, Eugen Wigner, another Nobel laureate. So those kind of things are subtle, but I don't think Oppenheimer ever had that private conversation with Einstein over going to the Manhattan Project and stuff like that. I, I doubt very much that ever happened. <clears throat> yeah, and so it, the the movie really portrays Oppenheimer as sort of this rock star of a physicist. Was he actually, you know, a rock star? I mean, because, you know, as I've read, you know, Richard Rhodes's books and as I've read, you know, much of the history, you know, and so I would say I'm, I'm pretty, pretty solid on the history of the development of, of of the understanding of the atom. It's hard to say that that Oppenheimer was more than somebody who people thought, oh, well, he's had some sort of creative ideas, but he wasn't an experimentalist. He wasn't sort of pushing the science forward by the things he did. Well, that's so, fair. I, okay, that's fair. No, Oppenheimer, clear, he was very brilliant. He really was smart. Uh, he got involved, he got his degree at Göttingen in uh, Germany in the 1920s, just as quantum physics, the modern physics was being developed. The head of the physics department there was Max Born, and Oppenheimer worked directly for Max Born. But he, that's also where Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, Enrico Fermi, oh God, Aaron Fest, all these great men, some of all these great uh, scientists of the 20th century were all working there. So he got to mix in with them, and he, he was brilliant. He was very, very smart, and he had... He had a magnetism about him, and he did draw students to him. Uh, he, his classes in physics were extraordinarily popular, and very, very powerful uh, young students would flock to get into his class. So there's no doubt about it. He was he had quite a bit of magnetism about him. He was very passionate, one way or the other, which made him a very complicated man. So during the Manhattan Project, he was very much in favor of developing the bomb, the atom bomb, with all due haste, trying to get that thing going. But uh, but once once the bomb had been dropped and, and he became aware of the of the casualties and he saw that uh, some people were killed by the dropping of the bombs, then he, he, he reversed course. He, he made a he told the people of Los Alamos as he was leaving, it was immoral to work on on nuclear weapons. I mean, he made this complete reversal. And that had a profound effect on the scientists at Los Alamos. And some of them did, but some of them felt uh, that they would shy away from conducting that type of research. So he's complicated. He had quite a bit of magnetism, but, but he was, he, he was uh, uh, a leader in that sense. But he was not a mastermind. Uh, in the movie, they, they, they almost suggest he, uh, he's the guy who predicted black holes. That's not true. Um, if anyone deserves that, it's a guy named Albert Einstein with his equations. Uh, in the 1930s, when they were solving Einstein's equations, they were formulating that, you know, it's possible that something could get so massive, it could even hold on to light. But the, the, the boundary that separates a black hole from the rest of the universe is called the Schwarzschild radius. It's not called the Oppenheimer radius or anything like that. You know, there were other papers being printed. So they show one paper of Oppenheimer in which he wrote about... Um, you know, huge gravitational fields, but that's not the only one. There were others. There were other prominent physicists who were also writing in those days. And no, there, there's there's a reason why he didn't never got the Nobel Prize. You said it. He he really never did. He never really did come up with something super original in that sense. He was very bright, but I, I don't I don't recall ever seeing anything in my mind that would suggest he he invented something so new that it developed that he deserved the Nobel Prize. He gets called at one point in the movie, he's called the dilettante. And just, you know, from reading the act, you know, American Prometheus, it seemed like he was very much interested in lots of different things. 
And, you know, he sort of reminded me of, you know, an aristocrat from, you know, previous centuries where they would dabble in botany and dabble in poetry. And in some respects, he seemed, you know, he had multiple interests. Physics was one of them. Yeah, he was kind of a Renaissance man. You know, he clearly, he liked communism. He liked women. He liked, you know, he liked uh, his drink. Uh, he, He liked lots of things. And, you know, perhaps that's, you know, that lack of focus, you know, sort of prevented him from spending the requisite time. Because if you're learning Dutch and if you're learning German, if you're, you know, you're, you know, supposedly was highly well read in literature. And I mean, that all sort of takes your focus away. Well, yes, uh, he was well-rounded in that sense. Uh, and he came from a very, he, will, he came from a wealthy family. Um, one of the things I noted in my book, though, is that um, he had experienced Nazism in Germany when he was studying Germany. He, he saw the Third Reich coming in, fascism coming in. Um, and like many intellectuals in the 1930s, he turned to socialism as, a, as something that would counteract Nazism. So it wasn't only uh, many, many intellectuals in the 1930s kind of courted socialism. But as I mentioned, uh, Oppenheimer was extremely passionate, so he took it more. He became active. So even in class, they show it in a movie where um, Lawrence comes into his class and rips down political posters in his classroom. Uh, it's true that uh, that Oppenheimer would actually have open, I don't know what you'd call, communist type of uh, uh, affairs going on, even in class. And he would talk about politics, where he's supposed to be talking about quantum physics. He might be opening up his class and talking about philosophy and 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 that uh, and and that's that kind of passion and it's so in my book I bring up that whereas many of these intellectuals like Oppenheimer or Beta or <clears throat> Vicky Weisskopf some of these others these they were Jewish German Jewish American physicists but they all were associated with they all had seen Nazism they all saw life on the con- uh, that. And they, they seem to be more accepting of socialism or from the East, communism. And the people who were opposed to them after the war and drove and who were just as much afraid of Stalin getting his hands on a super bomb were also Jewish, but they were from Eastern Europe. They were from Hungary and Poland who had experienced communism and they knew they knew the power and how terrible Stalin was and, and how the communist system, they were, it was just as bad as the Nazis and they were just as adamant to keep, uh, not to allow Stalin to have a thermonuclear weapon all by himself, whereas Oppenheimer seemed to be okay with that. And that that became kind of the beginning of a rift, not only with Lawrence, but with many, many of the prominent physicists. I mentioned a few already, Wigner and and, uh, uh, Johnny von Neumann and others, that just um, felt you can't, no, you can't let Stalin have that kind of power by himself. And in fact, the Russians did have a thermonuclear program going in 1946. Uh, Oppenheimer said, well, if we don't do it, the Russians won't do it. And Louis, uh, Louis Alvarez and others talking to him, they said, well, I don't think most Americans would, would agree with your assessment. And in fact, the Russians in 1946 had started a thermonuclear program under a physicist named Igor Tom at the National uh, uh, Physics Institute in Russia. And one of the first people Tom hired was a man named Andrei Sokharov, who became the father of the Russian hydrogen bomb. I mean, so no, the Russians were well on their way. At, at the same time, Oppenheimer was saying, no, they're, you know, let's just be nice and the Russians will follow our lead. No, they were not going to follow our lead. Yeah, that was, you know, for uh, one, one of the things I've noticed, particularly having written a few articles in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist in dealing with physicist is physicists are very good at at physics but they're not very good at politics and they don't seem to understand warfare they don't seem to understand ambition they don't seem to understand authoritarianism they're very optimistic about things because i you know perhaps it's the nature of being a scientist that hey we can build we can understand we can and so maybe it makes you optimistic but it seems that Oppenheimer and many others like, like, you know, their descendants of today uh, were a bit um, overly optimistic about, you know, how you can reach agreement and consensus and peace. 
with those who are, you know, diametrically opposed to your very existence. Right. Uh, you're right. Many of the arguments, and I've been through this so many times in my life, uh, but they totally dismiss that for the last, what, 72 years, we've had a strategic deterrence in place, which has seemed to have worked. It was designed... It was designed to deter the Soviets from launching a massive missile attack over the North Pole against our country. And for 72 years, it's pretty much worked. And they're constantly complaining it. Uh, you'll have the one book about command and control. You know, we almost had an accident here and had an accident there. To me, it, it, it's a testament to how good things were done, that even with all those accidents, nothing ever happened. These things were purposely designed to withstand accidents and to do that. And they all worked. Everything worked. And there's no credit given to how valuable that deterrence was. And in fact, that's the backbone of my book, is that when Kennedy became president, he was immediately tested by Khrushchev. Uh, very much, uh, Khrushchev was like Putin today on steroids. Uh, Khrushchev told all the democracies of Western Europe, I have a super bomb I can drop on each of your capitals. I want you out of Berlin. You know, basically his idea was we're gonna take over Berlin, then we'll take over Germany, maybe France after that. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time uh, and and, they, and Khrushchev was using this, uh, what they called nuclear diplomacy, to push things that way. And Kennedy, God bless him, was not about to do that. He, Kennedy stood fast. He was not about to submit two and a half million West Germans to communism. And he right away, he held firm. And uh, the, at the climax of my book, uh, Kennedy comes to the realization that the thing that gave him the backbone to stand up to Khrushchev was the fact that we had this really robust uh, nuclear deterrent posture in there and that Khrushchev could not do what he said he was doing without destroying himself. And Kennedy admits that gave him the backbone for that. And as I bring up in my book, uh, six months later, he flies out to Berkeley to personally thank those physicists for helping to avert a nuclear war because they gave him, in that case, the Polaris warhead. I spoke to Mike May, who was one of those physicists who was standing inside the lobby of the uh, Rad Lab I said, Mike, what, what was it like meeting President Kennedy? And he says, well, Tom, he says, the president came through the front door, walked through the lobby with a big smile on his face, stepped right up to me, stuck his hand out and shook my hand and said, thank you so much. Mike said it was the proudest day of my life. And I said, at that point, I knew I had to write their story on what they had done for our, our nation, how society doesn't realize how powerful and how important that was to get us through a nuclear uh, crisis, much worse than the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is what we all know about. Everyone says, oh, yeah, the big crisis was Cuba. No, in my mind, the, the bigger crisis was the year before in Berlin. And the reason we don't know about it was it was so serious. The president didn't get on TV and pump his chest and say this or that. He was white. His face was white in the pictures. He was nervous. We were going to have a thermonuclear war. He started up a program to protect Americans from a thermonuclear war. That's when they started building all those air raid shelters. I know in New York City, they were being, being built all over the place. I had no idea they were being built because the president thought we were about to go to a thermonuclear war. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the Anwa Deterrent Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. So go back a few years to where we'll get to this point. And as we, as we talk about, you know, you, you've talked about the Kennedy administration, but after the war, you know, Oppenheimer has sort of his, I don't know if you want to call it a mea culpa moment, but just the realization of, you know, what this means. And there was a split within the scientific community as to those who said, hey, 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 this this thing can spin out of control. We need to do something about it. And, you know, that sort of faction, they, you know, founded the Bolts and the Atomic Scientist. And then there were those who said, hey, we've got to stay ahead of the Soviets. We can't let them become our peers, our equals, because that's more dangerous. Can you tell us about who shook out where, sort of what were those arguments? How did that that sort of event and then the formation of Livermore and Sandia and, you know, how did all sort of that history take place? Yeah, thank you. That, that is the mass of the book. How Exactly what you just asked is what the middle of my book covers. But what happened is, is just that you had Oppenheimer became a leader. He, he At the end of the war, when it came out, 
that the atom bomb had been uh, designed at Los Alamos and he was called the father of the atomic bomb and he became a national hero. And so he had quite a following. I mean, Time Magazine, everyone, he was, time, he was man of the year. And this same individual was very much, very adamant that we need to uh, uh, get rid of nuclear weapons. That, uh, and the, atti the attitude he took, which was also reminiscent of, of the others, was that let's negotiate, let's just act, act well, don't act, uh, don't act in a provocative way, and the Soviets will do the same thing. And that was his main, and, and the main characters behind him, Hans Bethe was another one that went that way. Lilienthal, who was the first chairman of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, he was a very avid person. In fact, Lilienthal was also associated with the demonstrations in Chicago when they were creating the bulletin uh, and the uh, atomic scientist in Chicago. So he was very active there. And so they had that following. And then as you said, there were others. And what I tried to do is diagnose that too in my book, try to understand it. And I made that observation that the ones who were kind of leading the countercharge were, no, 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 not so fast, was just as much everybody was in agreement that it would be a disaster for Hitler to have an atomic bomb by himself. <clears throat> not everyone was in agreement that if Stalin or socialism had a big weapon, that would not be as dangerous, that that would be okay. But it was the physicists, it was those Eastern Europeans, leaders from, you know, Teller, Edward Teller, Johnny von Neumann, von Kamajan, the guy who created the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Eugen Wigner, Nobel laureate who ran Hanford. And then in America, people like John Wheeler, who probably the greatest American physicist of the 20th century. Uh, they, they, they felt, well, no, it would be really bad. It's just as bad for Stalin to have that type of military power by himself as it would have been for Hitler. And 10 years later, so, and Lawrence, of course, Ernest Lawrence, as he did back in 1940, in 1950, once again, he, he picked up, he warned the government that we had a threat steamrolling to us and, the, and the, um, we needed to prepare for that. And just as much as we needed an atomic program in 1940, so too we needed a thermonuclear program in 1950. Because the, uh, as was shown in the Mike device, the first thermonuclear device to go off, it was almost a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. This was big, big news. This was really serious and it needed to be controlled and we could not allow ourselves to be intimidated by, by a Stalin like government having sole possession of that. And that it did break down. But to be honest with you, most people in Washington, the, the, certainly the president Truman, Later, President Eisenhower, the Secretaries of State Dulles, Secretary of State Barnes, Secretary, uh, the Secretaries of State, the, certainly the Secretaries of Defense, all the key individuals in our government responsible for national security, all unanimously felt that we needed to have a robust thermonuclear program to keep up with the Russians. Of course, in, by 57, the Russians had launched Sputnik, which added another dynamic that the uh, the super bomb could be delivered within 30 minutes. There would be no warning. And that really got people's attention and really drove lots of debates about how do we best protect ourselves kind of thing. So, yes, uh, it was loud on the other side. And it seems to be uh, William Borden wrote that book, There Will Be No Time. He says it seems to be an American disease that we like to fall back like we have after every war and say, OK, let's just be nice and, and the other side will be nice, too. And he said, it's never worked. It's not going to work in the future. And, and I think he was right. And, and when the Cold War began, uh, frankly, most people, most, certainly most politicians, I think most of the American public did realize that we had a real threat coming out of the Soviet Union and we need to do something to protect ourselves. Was there, you know, so for, for many of these folks who sort of dabbled with communism out of sort of a, you know, what's the opposite of, of Nazism? I would argue it's not communism, but we'll, we'll set that aside. They perceived it to be uh, communism. And so there was this attraction to it, the promise of this, you know, egalitarian utopia, everybody's taken care of, everybody, you know, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And was there ever a point, did you see anything in your research where those who were sort of optimistic 
about it, where they saw, you know, maybe, I mean, by the 30s, you know, this is when 10 million Ukrainians were starved to death. Or whenever, you know, millions and millions of Russians were were murdered by, you know, Stalin. Was there ever a point at which these people who thought, oh, this is a good thing, we need to be friends with Stalin, we need to share, you know, because there's a big theme in the movie, hey, you know, we might need to share this with with Stalin, you know, this, you know, this is something we should probably do. Was there ever that realization that, you know, Stalin and the Soviet Union are are bad, that they're murderous, that you can't equate them with the United States? Or was it just people sort of always were sympathetic and there were ones who were never sympathetic? Or did you ever see sort of that transition to wait, whoa, these guys are bad. We were mistaken. Um, it's a bit complicated. So what I mean by that is uh, socialism, not communism, but socialism became popular. In fact, one of my favorite authors, John Steinbeck, if you read The Grapes of Wrath, you know, when the, when a family arrives in, in California, they're, they're, when they finally see a ray of hope is when they go into more or less a commune you know, run by the government, you know, that's taking care of the people and that. And Steinbeck is obviously he's suggesting this is the solution to the Great Depression is the government. The government needs to come in, create these um, uh, create these uh, uh, communes, if you will, around the nation. And that it, it, it was it was a popular intellectual solution to that. And Roosevelt, frankly, Roosevelt himself was kind of akin to that. Uh, you know, created all the great programs of his, but he was very proactive. And at that time, the government needs to step in and take over, take over the social social programs for the for the people of the nation. So that kind of underlying idea had become popular, and um, I think that it's like people would overlook. I mean, the Soviet Union was clearly dangerous. The their revolution. Uh, uh, where the whites against the reds, you know, that took place in the early 1920s. And then they're conquering of Poland. And then, and then, they, then they start a war with Finland. And then they, they, they interject themselves into, into Spain and take on the uh, Republican side of the Spanish Civil War as opposed to the fascist side. So you had this tete-a-tete between the fascists and the communists going on in the 30s. People tended to overlook it. The, the big thing that won the banners in the... Uh, the United States was the Lincoln Brigade. These were really uh, energetic Americans that were going to fight for the Republicans. Now, they didn't say communists. They would say Republicans and the socialist rule. So those kind of ideas were, were kind of popular. They seemed, It seemed to be the suffering going on in the Great Depression was so great that people were simply screaming for a solution to this. And it did seem like more government action was needed in order to, to make everyone's lives better. Uh, and the idea that Russia... Uh, coordinated the invasion of Poland with Hitler, you know, actually helped start World War II by co- collaborating on the invasion of Poland. That was overlooked once. Once the Soviet, you know, once Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, well, now the now the Russians are on our side. Now they're friends. Now now they're our friends. And I think there was a great hope at the end of World War II that that alliance that had been created in World War II. Uh, between the democracies in Western Europe and the socialists of Russia, which finally stay together, that 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 alliance would stay after World War II, and the Russians would remain our allies for that, and and that that never that was never in our mind, and they were kind of slow. A lot of uh, a lot of these philosophers or the people of that thought process were pretty slow in a pickup that. That this thing is getting pretty bad. I don't think it was until really into the 1960s when you have Zoltanitsyn writing the Gulag Archipelago, uh, and then there's you know the life of Ivan Ivanovich. You know the one day in the life of Ivan Ivanovich. I mean, I read those when I was in college and in high school. That it that really that the Gulag was coming out and how our god awful life was. Now the Hungarians revolt in 1956. The Czechs are conquered in 1968 with the Czech. Spring is is by that time, especially I think after the Hungarian Revolution of '56, then books started coming out. The Ugly American would come out, and also after '49, with the uh, 
the formation of communist China, which I do also bring up in my book. Suddenly you not only had the Iron Curtain, but now you have the Bamboo Curtain. And it looked like, you know, half the world was now under communism. And Khrushchev and Mao Zedong were outwardly saying, this is a world revolution. We will conquer the world. I remember there was a headline when Khrushchev came to America and he went to Disneyland. This is 1959, I think, 58, 59. And the headline said, we will bury your grandchildren. This was Khrushchev. What he was saying is the whole world will eventually become communist. And that, and at that point, I think around the 60s, I think people, and when Kennedy comes in, Kennedy's, why well, it hit a point is, is Eisenhower was kind of, you know, he still was trying to get things under control, if you will. But, but Kennedy, when Kennedy came in, he was adamant that the world's greatest danger was communism and the United States needed to lead the free world to face and go against communism. And that's where I think it really did gel. When Kennedy became president, it really did gel. And unfortunately, that poor man was assassinated uh, too early. But um, but that's why I think it's either gel. So there was, I think there was a hope. I think many people hoped for good times, uh, but it wasn't to be. It simply wasn't to be. So here's what we'll do. So we're out of time for this episode. And, but what we will do is we'll continue because there's a lot more left in your book. We we sort of added this broader discussion of Oppenheimer for this episode. But for you, the listeners, Tom's going to hang around. We're going to record a second episode. And then that's that'll be, you know, the, the episode that follows this one. So we'll stop for now. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you on the next episode where Tom stays with us. So I just wrapped up two episodes with Tom. So this, this, you know, this afterthought is at the end of episode one. So of course I'm going to tell you to stay for episode two because we talk about, um, you know, Oppenheimer's security clearance investigation and all that. And then we get into some other sort of early 60s stuff that went on and how the, you know, Livermore was formed and what happened. So it's pretty interesting. Hopefully you found this episode interesting. I, you know, the stories and it's sort of good to know like what's true in a movie and what's not true and, and just sort of what, what was going on around this focus on Oppenheimer. And I, you know, Tom's a good storyteller. And, I, you know, his book is great, From Berkeley to Berlin. If you haven't got it, read it. It's interesting, and it's pretty easy to read. So I think hopefully you enjoyed the first episode, and hopefully you'll enjoy the second one. This has been a production of the Anwar Deterrent Center, a 501c3 that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Crunkle. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at NuclearCast.